I like talking about the, uh, what would you call it, compartments of the mind and how they don't necessarily interact. Um, yesterday I dealt with uh, the issue of having contradictory beliefs, I guess, or contradictory positions, where Laura Layla pointed out that anger actually can be a positive or a useful motivation to get things done, which I kind of agree with. Very difficult to actually um, to harness that emotion to one's benefit, but I suppose it can be done. Whereas another part of my mind says anger is just bad. It's There's no redeeming qualities. Again, that's kind of Seneca-esque. Um, <clears throat> but um, I can see that the other side of anger is you can use it sort of as a, I don't know, a pin jab to sort of get yourself motivated to do things, to focus your mind. Um, I noticed that in my years in union politics, the killer instinct counted over time. If you actually personalized your political competitive um, nature, if you really wanted to nail the people to whom you were with, with whom you were competing, um, you tended to be you tended to succeed in the game um, when you just sort of said, "I'm going to get that sob," and you really hated his guts or her guts. In that, in the case of the union, half of the people are men, are, are women in my local. So yeah, I guess anger could be useful to achieve certain goals. As to whether or not it's actually good for us, hmm, that's open to question. It served me well if I was in a life that consisted of it, what seemed like at the time one long shouting match. Um, yeah, being angry actually is a useful reinforcement to, you know, someone in that milieu. <clears throat> so yes, perhaps in some way I did actually believe simultaneously that anger is a toxic state that has no redeeming qualities, and I believed that it was useful as sort of a firebrand in the butt <laughs> to get you moving, to get people. Uh, or to get things done, if you can sort of get indignant about something, angry about something, predatory even. Um, the ancient Greeks sort of thought that human beings are natural predators and that strife is practically our natural condition. And if you look at the history, it's just everybody against everybody in ancient Greece all the time, practically. So you can see where they would get that. But they had things like the Olympic Games or they had elaborate rules of war whereby you know, they would limit the damage that this natural tendency towards mutual self-destruction uh, can be channeled without destroying society. I think that's the way we see sort of capitalism nowadays, um, or politics. If, you're, if you have the killer instinct, then go over there into the business world. That's pretty cruel, and you can indulge your natural predatory instincts that way, dealing with the competition that way or whatever, and that, you know, it's not to say that it's not without damage, but it's less damage than jumping behind a barricade and throwing grenades or something at each other. Um, competition has, or the nor normal competitive nature, the killer instinct that's in us, has outlets that can limit the damage done. <clears throat> so, okay, to be human is to feel anger. Anger needs to be dealt with. That's why we have things like blood sports or whatever. Okay, I get that. So we can simultaneously believe two different things. Here's another case, another one of my contradictions, um, just to sort of say that the human mind is capable of them. Um, I formed my opinions of the world, like you know most people my age in the 1970s, based on you know what was going on in the world. It wasn't a great decade for the United States, and being in Canada, I watched U.S. news all the time, and one of the things that you noticed was you know the collapse of U.S. foreign policy, which was depressing for Americans, and um, also a sudden surge in violent crime, where, you know, a lot of parts of American cities looked like they were going to become war zones. They didn't become war zones, of course, but, you know, compared to what things were like in the 50s, the 70s were pretty unstable. So, you, you know, you think of, you get these feelings like, when you hear the terms like the Bronx or um, East L.A. or something like that, you think of an extremely dangerous place <clears throat> in an irrational sense. You just go, oh, I wouldn't go there. Well, I've vacationed several times in places like Colombia, 
I took, I spent a month in Cali, Colombia, and I spent another two weeks split between um, Bogota and Medellin. Uh, that's dangerous. But I knew it was dangerous before I went there, and I said, I'm just going to take the proper precautions, even though I tend to be risky in, in my, or I tended to be risky in my, um, in my uh, choice of activities, i.e., I like I, I used to like boozing it up in out-of-the-way bars in dodgy neighborhoods in places like Colombia. Um, not very reputable, but I thought it was fun. I was single, though I had no responsibilities, you know. I knew that it was dangerous, but the danger was part of the fun, I suppose. <clears throat> and I kept my wits about me. I, I never really um, lost it. Uh, I never really let my guard down completely, and as a result, I had very little trouble there. But I knew that, I, that, that where I was was dangerous. I probably would have a tough time spending a month in a dangerous U.S. neighborhood, even though it's far less dangerous than, for example, Medellin, Colombia. Why is that? Well, because when I was a kid, I was constantly frightened by tales of violent crime in U.S. inner cities, because crime was on the increase, and people didn't know where it was going to go. Uh, they had, the, the, the 70s was an era of foreboding for a lot of Americans, and a lot of Canadians. Our, our violent crime rate shot up, too. Maybe it was across the Western world that this happened, I don't know. But, <clears throat> no matter how dangerous, say, the Bronx might have gotten in, the, in, in New York in the 1970s, it was nowhere near as dangerous as Cali or Medellin are when I visited them. I took a vacation in Sri Lanka, and without understanding that there was a war going on, or I didn't know that the army was about to launch an offensive against the Tamil Tigers, I decided to go visit Anuradhapura, which is one of the more beautiful temple sites in northern Sri Lanka. It just so happened that I was there when the Sri Lankan military decided to have the final reckoning militarily with the Tamil Tigers. Well, I didn't seek out a conflict zone for a vacation, but I wasn't going to allow that to mess up my enjoyment of the Anuradhapura temples dangerous behavior. Crazy, really. But I, I was walking around thinking, everyone else is terrified of being here. I've got these beautiful ruins all to myself. You know, and my, um, my uh, tour guide was a Muslim who, uh, that in Sri Lanka is completely neutral, so he was safe when the Tamils and the Singhala people were fighting. The Muslims are kept out of it. But I wasn't as safe as he might have been. But yet that, that was much more dangerous than, as I say, being in the Bronx or something like that. Um, and yet, to this day, I would sort of go, oh, I can't go to the Bronx. Uh, that's, that's probably dangerous. <clears throat> I'd go to Trenchtown in Jamaica, no problem. <laughs> you know, I'd just say, ah, what the heck. I, you can't worry about crime and stuff when you're on vacation in Jamaica, so the heck with it. But, you know, that's a lot more dangerous than, you know, any dangerous part of an American city. My perception of crime is not rational. When I, when I see figures that tell me that a place is dangerous, <clears throat> it doesn't have the same effect on me as the sublogical or as the reptilian part of my brain. The reptilian part of my brain, which was probably formed in the 1970s with Walter Cronkite telling us about urban decay and violence, um, and that tells me that, you know, sublogically, American cities are dangerous. But I didn't even know that Columbia existed at the time. I didn't know about the Tamil Tigers. I didn't know about, uh, oh, I don't know, what other dangerous places have I been. <laughs> I didn't know about, you know, various, you know, Manila or, or you know, uh, Tondo in Manila, a, a dangerous place, far more dangerous than any of the other places I've mentioned. Um, I didn't hear about any of these places, but I've been to all of these places in my adult life, and I didn't walk around thinking I was going to be killed. Um... <clears throat> That's not logical. My perception of the safety of the streets in American cities is not logical. It's not based on facts. And yet the idea is still there that U.S. inner cities are dangerous. I'm not going there. And I wouldn't have a problem going to other places that might be more dangerous simply because my logical mind has approached these cities, my adult mind, whereas ideas of American cities were formed 
and burned into my consciousness at a point when I was far more impressionable and far more likely to see the sense of foreboding and have it stick with me for the rest of my life because I was so young when it happened. So you can believe things that are contradictory and you're, it's never clear what the basis for your belief is. Is your opinion of something logical? Okay, you sort of think, okay, well, regardless of whether or not certain American inner cities are absolutely dangerous um, when compared with, or sorry, comparatively dangerous compared to other cities in the world, it's still more dangerous than I am now. So it's, it kind of makes sense for me to feel that, say, I don't know, uh, East LA is kind of dangerous. <clears throat> it makes sense for me to think that way. Why do I think that East LA is more dangerous than many places I've walked through with a fair amount of confidence? That doesn't make sense. Um, that's the irrational, sort of co-opting my view almost in tandem with the rational. The rational is getting me a little bit of, of the way. Let's say that it is dangerous, to be honest, comparatively speaking, to be in certain American inner cities. And yet, the irrational adds to that and makes me think that it's more dangerous than it is compared to other places I've been. That's the compartmentalization of the mind that takes place, and if anything, it may get more acute as you get older. Um, <clears throat> that fascinates me the human mind's ability to wrap itself around inconsistencies, perhaps even contradictions like that. But it does seem to be inevitable in being a human being. Um, and I guess that's something that you have to learn to either accept or contain, is how do you deal with the fact that we do actually have contradictory beliefs? We don't just disagree with each other. We disagree with ourselves most of the time. 